Um, I am a recent member of the ICTS family. Uh, I visited Spenta before this campus opened, I, I think either two or three years ago, uh, and gave a lecture for him. And, you know, to meet Spenta is to love Spenta. And to love Spenta is to be enlisted as part of the ICTS family. So <laughs> it is. <laughs> and uh, I recently joined the board about a year ago, and this is my first time at the campus. It's, it's really thrilling. Um, I spent a lot of time at the IAS. I spent some time at KITP when it was ITP. Uh, so years ago, even before David went out there, I, I think. Uh, I love those two institutions. I, I've spent more time at the IAS. Um, and it's really exciting here. There we go. So there's the happy birthday. Um, so I feel conflicted about this talk. I've been, you know, probably 80% of my research over the last 12 to 14 years has been on graphons, which we heard about in Sharaf's talk. Um, and uh, they've actually started to become useful and not just pretty math. I mean, useful to someone besides a mathematician. They were useful to mathematicians earlier, but useful to someone besides a mathematician. And I saw all these wonderful talks in which, you know, people were talking about lines of research that they had been doing for many, many years. And so I thought I would not do this because this is really out on a limb for me. I'm, we are doing uh, uh, theoretical physics here, not mathematical physics. So being a mathematician, you know, you always feel out on a limb when you don't have a theorem. On the other hand, I think that this is a nice thing for this audience because it really is trying to use physics to answer questions about what are going on in deep neural nets, which is something that everybody hears about these days, and setting up conjectures for mathematicians. So uh, what I'm going to do is, um, is first give you uh, a, pri a primer on phase transitions. OK, I think most of you will know this, but maybe some of you won't. And then I will tell you how you can view when it's hard to compute something. So the, the, the computability in terms of a statistical physics view, and Christos, um, Christos alluded to this, and this is something that, it's actually the way I landed up at Microsoft. I was looking at phase transitions in NP-complete problems, and Nathan Mirvold, the first CTO of Microsoft, said, oh, then you belong at Microsoft, which seemed kind of crazy 20 years ago. It doesn't seem as crazy now. And then some very recent work of ours in the past year or two. So ours is mine and Christian and Ricardo Zakina and some of the young people who work with him um, on trying to understand learning neural nets, OK, um, from a statistical physics approach. OK, so. For those of you who might not know, uh, let me give you an example of a phase transition in an ordered system. The easing magnet, you have spins which are up, and up or down at each point, and you have a ferromagnetic coupling so that J is bigger than zero. And so, uh, you know, you, you find a non-analyticity in the expected value of the spin. And it, the way I want us to be thinking about it right now is the states of the system. So at high temperature, everything is all mixed up. And at low temperature, there are two extremal states, OK, representing principally up and principally down. And as you change you know, the, the, the temperature, they become more extreme. But there, there are just two extremal states, OK? Something like a spin glass, and I really should be looking at it in more um, in more than two dimensions, but that was something I found on the web and I didn't want to draw it myself. Um, uh, so here you have a random coupling, Jij. You could take it to be a Gaussian or you could take it to be a Gaussian centered at zero, or you could take it to be 
plus or minus one with probability a half. Here, the adjacent spins get confused. Some of their neighbors are telling them to be up. Some of their neighbors are telling them to, to be down. And the phase diagram here has, again, a mixed up state at high temperatures. But as you go to low temperatures, there are many, many extremal states, extensively many in the size of, of the system. There's a very complex energy landscape. OK, so a number of us realized that um, we could explain. So it, it was probably Scott Kirkpatrick was um, the first one I, I heard talking about this 22, 23 years ago. Can we explain the difficulty of computation by analogy to phase transitions in spin glasses? And so the three satisfiability problem, for those of you who don't know, is one of the canonical problems of theoretical computer science. It's the canonical NP-hard problem. And so what I have here is I have n variables, which can be either true or false, OK? And then I have m constraints. So a constraint could be something like, uh, so x2 has to be true, or x5 has to be false, or x8 has to be false. OK, so there are three ways of satisfying this. Now I'm going to put a lot of them together. OK, so if I chose to satisfy this by taking x2 to be true, then over here I would just have two ways left to satisfy it. And there are m, my, so obviously, if I have lots of variables and very few constraints, I'm going to be able to satisfy it. If I have tons and tons of constraints and very few variables, I'm not going to be able to satisfy it. Um, and in general, determining whether a given f is satisfiable is an NP, is a computationally difficult problem. Okay, it's the canonical NP problem, and NP hard problem. OK, so physicists immediately said, let's look at random satisfiability. So let's just take n variables drawn uniformly at, at random, plus or minus 1. And I'm going to negate each one of them with probability a, a half. So it turns out random 3 set is not just hard, but it's hard on average. OK, so it's not just that there's some instance in there that's hard. It's a very hard problem. It's hard on average. And this is what got, I mean, this is why people like Giorgio Parisi and Mark Mazar and all the spin glass people jumped in, is because it turns out to be mathematically analogous to the dilute spin glass. So instead of just plus and minus one, let's say a lot of the JIJs were zero. So it turns out to be some, somewhat more tractable than the spin glass, but still very, very interesting. And if n is large and m is small, this is easy to satisfy, OK? If I have a lot of x's, um, you know, if n is small and m is large, it's hard to satisfy. And there's a phase transition as a function of alpha equals m over n. And it, it really is mathematically precisely analogous to a phase transition in something like a spin glass. So very complex energy landscape. 2SAT is easier than 3SAT. Setting up a device, that's not very nice. Hopefully it'll, well, OK, let me. Is it going to go away? If it's not going to go away, I'm going to try to get it to go away. There we go. Oh, I don't want to do that. It'll just get worse. OK, so this is something that Christian and I were working on you know, 16, 17 years ago. We looked at 2SAT, easier problem. We were able to show there was a phase transition. We could get inside the phase transition and see the critical exponents. Much, much harder with 3SAT. In fact, even proving that there was a transition took you know, 16, 17 years after our, our analysis. And they still haven't gotten inside the phase transition. OK, so here's the statistical physics interpretation. In the phase where solutions exist, the energy landscape is very complex. And so you can look at something like, how long does it take to construct a solution to this, or to prove that there is no solution in the unsatisfiable phase. And you see the difficulty of computation really peaking 
here. I mean, here what you're doing is getting a proof that no solution exists, and here a solution does exist. It gets harder and harder to find. The way you would try to find a solution, if you ran into a contradiction, if you'd done some of the clauses, you ran into a contradiction, you would do the same kind of thing you do in a crossword puzzle or Sudoku. You would kind of backtrack. And you say, okay, let me change this one, and then I go back a little bit, and then I try to go down uh, until I satisfy it. There are algorithms, backtracking um, algorithms that, that do this, and, um, and so that's most of what people are using here. These are Davis-Putnam calls on, on the y-axis. And the explanation is the connectivity of the solution space. And so uh, this is a physics analysis, no proofs, but it's very compelling, and some of the understanding of this picture actually went into the proof that there is a phase transition, although the picture itself was not proven. So what's going on? What's going on is that in the beginning, I can get by a finite number of backtracks, I can get from any solution to any other solution, okay? The near, nearby solutions, okay? So I, then what happens is that there is a, so there, there's a point at which the solutions break up into clusters, and to get from one cluster to another, I'd have to change of order n variables. Okay, so things are really stuck. When you're within a cluster, you can still move around. Then there's a condensation phase where only a couple of big clusters are left, and then finally, of course, when there are no solutions, there are no clusters left. Okay, so it is, what is hard here is that you can't move from one solution to another. So how the hell do you find them with any kind of a local search algorithm? Okay, now we're on to something totally different, deep learning. This is inspired by real neural networks in the visual system. You have layered stacks of these vastly simplified neurons like the perceptron, which I'll show you on the next slide. In many cases, the results are superhuman. Okay, it, this is, uh, you know, this is what's used in a lot of unsupervised learning. It's very versatile. So far, there's remarkably little theoretical understanding. So little, in fact, that some people question whether it's even true, which I think is crazy because it, it works so well. Of course, there's something there. Okay, I mean, some people say, oh, it's just a black art, and it is to some extent. There are certain people like Jan LeCun who really have a feel for what works and what doesn't work, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a good reason. It just means that we haven't discovered what it is. So here is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start to tell you our take on why this works. And it's going to be based on the connectivity of the solution space. Okay, so the building blocks in these deep neural nets are things like this, like the, per the perceptron. Here, um, because I want to show you something that's kind of amazing, I'm going to look at the perceptron with discrete weights. So what happens, and I'm going to talk about this in terms of training, although you can do it in an unsupervised fashion. So I'm going to input m images, or patterns, okay, each with n pixels or bits, and I am also going to give you some labels to train on. So I'm going to label these m images, Okay, like for example, just either cat or no cat. Okay, I look at the image, I say either cat or no cat. And the objective is to learn these weights, wi, such that when I take the dot product of w with the, you know, with the, um, uh, the image, okay, that I get the right thing, cat or no cat as many times as I can, and the energy is just telling me how many mistakes I make. So if I choose W based on these um, M images, how many mistakes have I made? Okay, I'm trying to make as few mistakes as possible. I'm training my neural net, okay? And so here's a statistical physics perspective on the binary perceptron. So you might ask, how many images can I, can I store? Okay, if I take the number of images on the order of the number of pixels per image, you're really asking this perceptron to store a lot, okay? 
And there was a physics analysis by Mark Mazar and Kraut in 1989, which showed that there was a phase transition at a particular value of m over n. Now, what's really interesting is, unlike random satisfiability, with discrete weights, local search algorithms could not find any solutions for any alpha, okay? So there's this whole range up to alpha equals 0.83 where there are solutions and I can't find any, okay? So what's going on, what's going on is that these solutions are isolated, okay? There's, so think about how we understood computability. We understood that as being able to get from one solution to the other pretty easily. Here, all of the solutions are of order n away from each other. We get fewer and fewer solutions un until we have none, but I can't get from any of them to any other one. This is a characteristic of the discrete perceptron, wi equals plus or minus one, okay? And so obviously I'm stuck. I mean, a local search heuristic would try to move between these and, you know, and I have to flip of order n bits. Okay, so how is deep learning of neural nets finding the minimum in this incredibly bumpy landscape? Okay, well, the fact is that deep neural nets never simply minimize the loss. There's always something else that they do. They do stochastic gradient descent. They do drop out. They do this. They do that. And we think it's that process that is actually taking them to solutions. Um, so could, could these additional procedures be helping to drive the system to find some other states that rather than looking like this, hard to get from one to the other, might have some wide minima. And wide minima would mean that I could generalize, right? Because it would mean, okay, now I've, I, I've trained it. I, I you know, give you some new stuff, and there's something else near, nearby it, okay? So, we came up with this idea of the robust ensemble, which is that, let's just take some alpha and say that there are e to some constant function of alpha times n solutions, okay? And now let's say, you might say, why, why do we think this? Well, it, fi it turns out that we can find these things. Let's say there are exponentially fewer solutions that have another property that we call dense states. They are surrounded by many, in fact, an extensive number of other solutions. So, but, but you'll never find them, right? You'll, you'll never find them on that scale. So how do I find them? What I do is I add an entropy term which, um, which tends to favor things which have a lot of solutions within a distance d, okay? So this is no longer the original problem, which is with this energy. In fact, when I'm looking at this, this is a non-equilibrium statistical physics problem because I've added a driving term, okay? It's taking me out of equilibrium, and I'm trying it... Can this help me to find these exponentially rare solutions that have a lot of other solutions next to them? Because these dense states are what will generalize. Okay, and so this is what we did in this paper with the same title in PNAS last year. We found these dense states, okay? Um, and so we sought this rather than the original equilibrium problem just with E, and how did we do it? This is only for physicists who know what I'm talking about. Technically, we, and mathematicians, well, they might consider it slightly compelling, take it to the form of a conjecture, maybe. Um, we were able to rewrite this entropy-enhanced cost function. Uh, so we did some transformations of the variables that turned out to be really nice. And they gave us the cost function as a sum over a variable number of replicas. And then we did replica calculations on one and two layer networks. Okay, so, it, you know, not the n layer networks, but at least one and two layer networks. And those showed that these states do exist. Okay, and 
heuristically what's going on is you kind of have these very, very spiky minima before. When you add this entropy term, you can vary it. There's a parameter in it corresponding to the number of replicas. And you eventually get to this point where you have things that look like wide global minima. Okay. And it gave us new algorithms. So we were able to do replicated simulated annealing, replicated gradient descent, replicated belief propagation. And in all these cases, we got to solutions faster and the solutions were more easily generalizable. Okay, so can we do something similar in deep neural nets? And also, you know, as I talked to, to most people in computer science, they were like, you know, they were just not taking us seriously. It was, it was very frustrating. <laughs> I went to people at Microsoft who were working on DNNs and they're like, you know, Jennifer, you're a mathematician. Christian, you're a mathematician. Ricardo Zakina, never heard of him. I mean, if you were a physicist, you would definitely have heard of him. Um, and they, they just wouldn't listen to us. So I, w I, I went to Jan LeCun, who's a friend, <laughs> and I sat down and I said, I really think I understand why your DNNs are working. And, uh, and I said, stochastic gradient descent looks like it would take you near these dense states. It looks similar to this driving term. And yes, and then th we said, and this explains why this procedure called dropout works. And he said, yeah, I know, I published that. That's and then, you know, we said, well, there are other things that a priori sound similar that don't work. And we gave him an example and he said, how do you know that? <laughs> we were like, well, because that's what our theory says. And he said, well, that's really strange because I tried that because it sounds similar and it didn't work, so I never published it. <laughs> and so then he started taking us seriously and what we did was that we did deep neural nets, so they were deep, and we also did continuous weights because some people said, oh, the only reason you're getting this weird stuff is because you're doing discrete weights, WI equals plus or minus one, and we said, no, we're doing discrete weights because we need them to do the replica calculations. So we did continuous weights. This is, this is the, uh, written in terms of this uh, Y number of replicas. This is what it looks like. This was the original energy. We added something else. And the weights are, are continuous, and, uh, and our, um, uh, th so let's see. Uh, so some of us are, so Christian and I are mathematical physicists, and uh, Baldassi and Saglietti and Zakina are statistical physicists, and the rest of them are computers, uh, DNN people, okay? And... So instead of the dynamics we had before, the discrete dynamics, since it's continuous weights, so we, we have Langevin dynamics. And lo and behold, we found these new global minima. And the important point is that there were two things that were, uh, that were really good. We got to them much more quickly. And most importantly, they were generalizable, OK? So, you know, uh, the, the gurus of DNNs. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be done well before that. Um, so the gurus of, uh, you know, co-authored with us. And now when I go in the DNN community, they're like, oh, yes, you guys did entropy stochastic gradient descent, which is what they're calling it now. Um, so anyway, I, I really think this explains it. I mean, for a physicist, I think it, it makes some sense that this all the other things they're doing with the back propagation, the stochastic gradient descent, do seem to be driving you to these exponentially rare states, which have exponentially many states around them, okay, and therefore are generalizable. So future work. First of all, for computer science, just to develop new DNN um, and related algorithms, which, you know, we've already done a number of them now. For physics, um, I think an interesting question is whether these dense states exist for other models. This is something which we find appearing for the perceptron, for something with the structure of a neural net. 
will this appear for things like easing magnets or I, d I don't know. So it's an interesting question. Are these, uh, are there dense states in these other systems such that, you know, I might try to do something entropy driven to find these states and would they be interesting? Okay, in mathematics, even going back to the equilibrium problem of, you know, taking that picture of KSAT where you have basically you can get in, you know, from one solution to another really easily to, okay, I can move around within my, my own cluster and there are a lot of clusters, almost no clusters. Can one prove that? And, non -e and then non-equilibrium statistical physics picture, this picture that I just gave you for the learnability of neural nets, and finally, theoretical computer science, which is math, by the way. I'm, I, I assume most of you know that. Most, I mean, what is called theoretical computer science is to computer science what mathematical physics is to physics. It's not what theoretical physics is to physics, okay? Um, so use the connectivity of the state space to rigorously establish that this is a picture of what's going on with the NNs. Okay, and so here's to the next decade where your faculty and visitors will solve some of these problems and, of course, a lot more. Okay. Yeah? Oh, we're waiting for a mic to get there. Okay. Uh, I was looking through some of uh, your publications, your group. So the computational biology group at MSR, I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more. <laughs> like you've done some stuff around CRISPR and Cas9. Okay, uh, well that's, that's some people in my group. Uh, they did wonderful stuff on, on CRISPR. One of the problems with CRISPR is there are lots of places where you could cut, okay? Uh, oh. and, and so which one do you choose? choose That's the on-target problem. The other thing with CRISPR is <laughs> how do you make sure it doesn't cut in the wrong place? That's the off-target. Uh, one problem is hard, the other problem is very hard. <laughs> and uh, Niccolo Fusi and Jen Lisgarden actually came up with very good ML algorithms, which are now the most widely used ones in, in the world for making those choices. So that has nothing to do with this, though. Uh, isn't... Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is, isn't what you're doing in SGD plus entropy something similar to uh, uh, dithering in the uh, image processing, but of course that's a single dimensional. So wait, it, to, to what in image processing? Dithering. It could be, I don't know that in, in image processing. I, I, so I don't know what that is in, in image processing because I, I it haven't eliminates done bias and things like that. Oh okay, yeah, we can, we can yeah, 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 probably is similar. Probably is similar, yeah. yeah hello. So uh, I, here, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> okay. So I, I would like to you know your comments about another statistical physics approach to DNN, which is based on a renormalization group. I'm referring to the work of Pankaj Mehta and Schwab. So they, 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 I mean, there's, they propose that there's a way of understanding deep neural networks based on a renormalization group. Uh, specifically the uh, RG by Kadanov, variational, variational approach of mm -hmm. RG. So uh, I suppose you are familiar with that, with that work. A I, I don't know all the details of it. I know of the existence of the work. I don't think there is necessarily a mapping from what they're doing to what we're doing because we are actually, we're not solving an equilibrium problem. Okay, so if you're doing the renormalization group on an equilibrium problem to find a solution, that would be very different than driving the system out of equilibrium. Uh, they may have a way of doing that on the original optimization function, but it's quite different if you, if, I mean, I've changed my Hamiltonian, right? Or you could view me as, uh, what, what I'm doing is driving the Hamiltonian 
so that it's a non-equilibrium problem. And I think their approach is more of an equilibrium problem. What we're saying is that the kinds of noise that they're putting in could be driving you to these, uh, to these robust states, to these dense, robust states. Thank you. Yeah. I was wondering if you would mind explaining a little bit more the connection between dense states and generalizability. Um, I know that for the longest time in the field, there's been this idea that if you if you optimize to a wide valley, it's likely to be more generalizable. Right. But there are also very recent results that show that with the appropriate geometrical transformation on the weights, you could turn an arbitrarily wide minimum into an arbitrarily sharp one. And that can't, of course, affect the generalizability because that's just a geometric transformation on the weights. So I was trying to understand a little bit more this. So I'm... I'm so I don't know this recent work okay. on the geometrical transformation of the weights, but I do know that empirically people have been, I'm, I mean, basically every empirical study people do, if they find a wide minimum, they find things that are generalizable, which of course to us makes a lot of sense, right? right? Okay. Uh, so I don't know if in the robust ensembles that we're finding here, there may be something special about them that leads to it not transforming. I don't know if, if the, the statement that you can transform a wide to a narrow minimum is true almost surely, is tr in, in, in what sense. So it could be that there's something about these states which makes them more robust than the generic wide minimum, because these are already exponentially rare states. So I, I, would, I would have to look at that argument and understand whether it's an argument for every wide minimum or only almost surely in some way and then try to see whether this could be escaping that. Take one more question maybe. Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again.